A friend of mine uh, recently told me this story. He was in a shopping mall with his daughter, and he asked her to run over to the Starbucks and get him a cafe americano. She came back with a coffee, and he noticed that she had more change than he was expecting she would have. He asked her about it, and she said, well, I saw the menu, and the cafe americano was $2.50, but then I also noticed a cup of hot water was $0.35, cents, and a shot of espresso was $0.75. Cents. So I bought you a cup of hot water and two shots of espresso, and I made your Americano for you. Now, that's critical thinking, right? <laughs> and whenever I tell this story to K-12 teachers, like, tell me how to get my students to do that. And the truth is that's very, very difficult, right? Uh, engaging cognitively in a situation where most people would not engage cognitively. Why don't we see more of that? If that's critical thinking, that's what we want. Why don't we see more of that? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is that thinking is hard, right? Thinking is taxing, um, requires attention, requires focus. And in addition, it's not obvious that it's going to pay off, right? You, you try and work the angles of the Starbucks menu. Many times there's not an angle to be worked, and it's not really going to pay off. So most of the time where there's an opportunity to engage cognitively, what we do actually is we first consult memory. We say to ourselves, have I been in a situation like this before? What did I do and how did it work out? And so what we do is we say, okay, I've been in Starbucks before, and as I recall, I gave them money and they gave me coffee, and I was pretty satisfied with that outcome. Right? And so you don't take it any farther than that. So I'm making it sound like memory is really an obstacle. Memory is the villain in critical thinking, because our first resort is to go to memory, and if we don't have to think, we won't. And that's in part true, but I think this argument moves too quickly. Uh, memory can be the villain, but memory can also be a really important ally. The question is whether or not you can actually touch base with, in memory, previous experience, times you have engaged cognitively and it worked out well for you. The answer is frequently you have useful information in memory that would help you in a critical thinking situation, but you don't realize that you have that information in memory. So let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. Here's a classic problem that's been used many, many times in cognitive psychology. If you're a subject in this experiment, you would be told these represent four cards. Each card has a letter on one side and a digit on the other side. And your job is to verify whether or not this rule depicted here is true. There's a vowel on one side, there's an even number on the other side. Now, it turns out this, people have a lot of trouble with this task. And usually only about 10 or 15% of people will answer it accurately. Um, the answer, as it turns out, is you need to turn over the A card and the 3 card. The A card people usually get. I need to see if there's an even number on the other side. It's the 3 card that people have trouble with. They don't recognize that there's a vowel on the other side. The rule's been disconfirmed. People also sometimes will turn over the 2 or the X card, which actually aren't relevant. The details of this are not so important, but what I do want to emphasize is how this uh, puzzle was first generated. It was generated actually because it embodies a deductive logical principle. If you've taken an introduction to logic course, you may remember seeing this. Across the bottom here, this is your uh, conditional, uh, conditional reasoning uh, forms, classic conditional reasoning forms. Modus ponens and modus tollens are in green because they are uh, deductively valid, affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent are in red because they are not deductively valid. So each one of these cards embodies one of these principles. Again, the details I'm not so concerned about. What I want to emphasize is this puzzle embodies this principle, uh, uh, these, these logical forms. We might guess, therefore, that if you have studied these logical forms, you will be good at this problem. Suppose, for example, an undergraduate had just completed an introductory logic course. You would hope that that undergraduate would be good at this puzzle. You see where I'm going with this. So Keith Holyoke at UCLA decided to try this, and what he did was he found a couple of logic courses. He administered the card problem at the start of the semester. He administered the problem again at the end of the semester, and he found no improvement at all. <laughs> And this makes us sad. <laughs> so this is emblematic of what I'm talking about. These students 
you know, got good grades in the course, performed well on the test, had studied this, and yet when they're confronted with the car problem, they do not recognize that they have information that is going to be useful to them in this critical thinking task. Right? So instead, what they try and do is critically think, and it actually doesn't work out so well. I'll give you one more example. Uh, suppose you and I are walking together uh, in Harvard Yard, and I say, I just, did you see that bird that just scuttled into the bushes there? That was a California quail. And a good response from you would be, don't California quail live in California? Right? And so what you're saying implicitly is, you are trying to identify something out there, and you're, you've got some information, you've got perceptual information, but you yourself recognize it's probably not perfect because the bird was moving fast and so on. What I'm suggesting is there's other information that's relevant here. The other information is the number of California quail generally available to be identified. So even if you're, say, 80% sure that you saw a California quail, I'm going to guess you probably didn't. It's more likely that you made a mistake. Right, so this is called using base rate information. You have diagnostic information. The number of quail available to be seen, that's the base rate population. That turns out to be relevant when you've got diagnostic information that's not perfect. This makes perfect sense to people. And in fact, in when you frame it as sort of a birding context, people will readily understand that base rate is information uh, is relevant. There are many instances where they do not recognize that the base rate is relevant. So here's a problem that has been administered many times where base rate information is relevant in a medical context. Probability of breast cancer is 1% for a woman at age 40 who participates in routine screening. If a woman has breast cancer, the probability is 80%. She will have a positive mammography. If a woman does not have breast cancer, there's a 10% chance of false positive. And then you ask people, someone comes to you and they have a positive mammography. What are the odds that this person has breast cancer? So this is very much like saying someone just thinks they saw a quail scooting into the wood. What is the chances that this is actually a quail? Here you've been given the base rate is 1%. Right? And yet people frequently ignore the base rate. The most common response is, well, it's about an 80% chance that this woman has breast cancer. And in fact, only about 10% get this uh, problem correct. And in fact, in some studies of advanced medical students and physicians, they don't do a whole lot better. Though medical education, I think, is uh, addressing this problem. Okay, so here again, we've got a situation where you're presented with a critical thinking task. You have information in memory that would allow you to do better on the task, but you somehow don't make contact with the, uh, with the information. Oh, is that my cell phone? Thank you. Okay. Yes, yeah, my pacemaker, right. <laughs> uh, what was I talking about? Right? <laughs> Critical thinking, that's right. Uh, and memory, that's what I was talking about. Um, Okay, so this is a different view of critical thinking, right? The Starbucks example, we're envisioning critical thinking being this sort of across the board bias to engage cognitively. And here I'm saying there's another way of thinking of critical thinking, which is you have stored in memory lots of bits and pieces that will help you think critically. It's a recognition. This is a situation that I've encountered before, and I know of a fruitful way to engage with this situation. Right? The difficulty is somehow touching base with memory and recognizing that you've, uh, that you've got relevant information. Right? So why is it that this is so difficult? Well, the answer is that the, uh, the, the structure of the problem, the psychologists call this deep structure of the problem. The deep structure of the problem is really hidden. What's relevant in the medical diagnosis situation? It's, I've got an imperfect Diagnost, diagnostic uh, instrument, and then I've also got base rate information. We call that the deep structure. I've shown you two sur surface structures in which that can be instantiated, right? Birding and medical diagnosis. Both of them have the same deep structure, and they have different surface structures. The problem is what's plain to you in a situation is the surface structure. It's plain to me that this is somehow about doctors and breast cancer and mammography. But the deep structure is not obvious. It's not explicit. The deep structure could be anything. The deep structure could be Newton's third law. The deep structure could be correlation is not causation. Right? So the difficulty is in getting to the deep structure. 
Okay, so how do you get to the deep structure? Well, psychologists have tried to find ways to hurry this up, to make it easier for people to see the deep structure, but the best, most reliable way we know of to see deep structure of problems is practice. And unfortunately, it takes a fair amount of practice. I've already given you one hint that a semester's worth of practice is not going to do it. Right? That was the logic problem. And students didn't get it. I'll give you one more example, a different experiment conducted by Mickey Chi at the University of Pittsburgh. So she took uh, standard problems out of a physics textbook, cut them out, pasted one problem per uh, on, in, on index cards, one, one problem per card, and then took this deck of problems and handed them to physicists and said, I want you to sort these problems. Sort them any way that, that makes sense to you. The physicists sort the problems based on the deep structure. Say, well, this is a conservation of energy problem. This is a rotational kinematics problem and so forth. Right? So they're seeing deep structure. Students who had just finished a one semester course in physics sorted them by surface structure. They put all the problems that had springs in them in one pile, all the problems that had inclined planes in them in another pile. So again, a single semester of even intensive college-level work is not enough to really see the deep structure of problems. Okay, so what do we conclude from this? What are the implications of this? What I'm suggesting is another way of thinking about critical thinking, that you can think of it as sort of a bag of tricks. And an important feature of this is that the bag of tricks is going to vary a lot. In the contrast to the Starbucks example, where we were thinking of critical thinking as monolithic, it's just this sort of bias to engage, this view of critical thinking is quite domain-specific. Right? So I, for example, have, there are certain types of problems that, or, or situations that demand critical thinking to come up again and again and again in my work as a cognitive psychologist. My daughter just graduated from Emerson College a year ago with a degree in theater. She's an aspiring director. She does lots of critical thinking, but the types of critical thinking that she does are wildly different than the type of critical thinking that I do. So if we think of it as a bag of tricks, everyone's bag of tricks is going to be quite different. So the challenge for educators, I think, given this view of critical thinking and given that it takes sustained practice, is that the development of critical thinking skills in our students really becomes a curricular issue. What we need to do is, as a group in our discipline, so organized by program or by department or by school, we need to get together and think, what are the types of problems, situations that demand critical thinking that come up time and time again in our discipline? that when our students graduate with a degree in our discipline, we want them to recognize and know how to engage with fruitfully. And once you have that list, you need to think, given that this can't, we can't do one per semester or two per semester, it requires sustained practice across semesters, given that that's true, how are we going to sequence and structure a curriculum to ensure that our students are getting that kind of practice so that they'll be capable when they graduate? And that, I'll suggest, is how you turn memory from being a villain in critical thinking into an ally for critical thinking. Thanks very much. I think we have a uh, question slide. Oh, you want me to click that? Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's a question for you to think about. Think about the curriculum in the department, program, or school with which you are most familiar. Do you feel confident that the depth, duration, and sequence of this curriculum provide students with the practice they need to think critically about standard problems in their discipline? And since there was such a robust chaotic interaction when you are encouraged to meet your neighbor, I'll encourage you to perhaps turn to your neighbor and discuss this uh, for 60 seconds or so 
uh, before you log in, and I think it's available on the website you are all you were all on shortly. Uh, and then we'll uh, so think about it, chat with your neighbor about it, and then vote. Okay, so here are the results uh, so far. And as we say in the South, y'all got some work to do. Um, this is a challenge, right? And I think it is a challenge that goes largely unrecognized, but I think it goes to the heart of one of the things that um, I see as, uh, as an educator. There are occasionally students who graduate who I know pretty well, and I think, I'm not sure you got everything out of this that you might have. Um, I'm not sure I've left you, I and my colleagues have left you with the skills and abilities and knowledge that, uh, that, that I would wish for and, and, and that I think you would wish for as well. And I think the curriculum issue is really relevant. Um, and I think it, it, it is something that I know at the University of Virginia in my department of psychology, this is something we're starting to think about and take seriously. 